previously on the seventh day. It's clear that loyalty to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment did not die out easily. The Sabbath is the day that marks two great events, the completion of creation and the completion of redemption. And now, part seven of the seventh day, revelations from the lost pages of history. for courage to die a noble death today. I will die for my faith, for the truth that I have loved. I will die because of those things that I have believed and taught according to the Holy Scriptures, both Old Testament and New. I will die today because I have observed the seventh day of the week as the Holy Sabbath of God. How did it come to this, this fiery death? I had such hopes. I had visions of the whole Russian church reforming, reviving the pure truth of the gospel. But now it comes to an end. Ivan III, he could not stay away. Once he was our friend. I wonder what is in his heart today. Look there. Elena and Dmitri, Sobotniks, Sabbath keepers like me, the Tsar's own daughter in law, his grandson. What will become of them? Will they burn too? Sophia, hmm. she should be happy today. She was against us from the very beginning. And Gennady, the Archbishop from Novgorod, he he has lived for this day, for this fire. He claims that we have turned away from Christ and become like the Jews. But I am a Christian, and I die today for love of Christ and his word.
Those horrific fires in Moscow 500 years ago signaled the death of the 15th century Russian Reformation, a Reformation characterized by its emphasis on observing Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath. The man in the cage, Ivan Karitsin, was a prominent Russian theologian and a leader of the religious uprising that historians call the Novgorod Moscow movement. The Tsar Ivan the Great found this movement already well established in Novgorod when he seized control of that city around 1480. Ivan found that two Russian Orthodox priests were at the heart of the movement. He invited them to Moscow. Dr. Oleg Jigankov explains. The reason Tsar Ivan uh, brought the two most prominent uh, priests, uh, Denis and Alexei, from Novgorod to Moscow was that he himself was somehow sympathetic to the reformers' views. And uh, Ivan installed them to be uh, the priests at the two most important uh, cathedrals in Moscow, in Russia, in Archangelsky Cathedral and at the Armenian cathedrals. Those two cathedrals are still uh, the most important cathedrals in Russia. But the Tsar wasn't the only one who was pro-reform. The Novgorod Moscow movement reached into the highest levels of government and included people in the Tsar's inner circle. The whole story reads like a great Gothic novel. On the one hand, you've got Elena Stefanovna, widowed daughter-in-law of the Tsar. And she's a Sabotnik. That is, she's a Sabbath keeper. On the other hand, there's the Tsar's wife, actually his second wife, Sophia, a Greek princess by birth. She grew up in Italy under the influence of the Roman Catholic leaders who hoped that her marriage to the Tsar would pull the Russians closer to the Church of Rome. But Sophia eventually adopted the Russian Orthodox religion. So Tsar Ivan is caught between these two women, both of whom have great influence on him and his court. And the two of them are on opposite sides of the religious controversy. But the plot thickens. <laughs> Elena's son, Dmitri, Ivan's grandson, is in line to become the next Tsar. And Dmitri, like his mother, supports the Sabbath-keeping reformers. Now, Sophia, remember, she's the Tsar's second wife, bore him a son named Vasily, and she wants her son to become Tsar after Ivan, and she'll stop at nothing to get her way. Sophia has a powerful ally in Gennady, the Russian Orthodox Archbishop of Novgorod. Gennady is a zealous, even fanatical enemy of the Sabbath-keeping reformers he calls for extreme measures. Listen to this. And in some of his letters uh, uh, addressed to the Russian Tsar, Gennady uh, venerates the methods of uh, Spanish Inquisition and uh, insists that Russian Orthodox Church and the Russian state should um, apply these methods towards the Russian Subotniks movement. Russian Orthodox Church leaders met at the Council of Moscow and condemned the reformers as heretics. The sentence of the Council details the charges. Some of you said blasphemy against many holy icons, and some of you cut the holy icons and burned them with fire. And you have all honored the Sabbath more than the resurrection day of Christ. Now, of course, the resurrection day is Sunday first day of the week. The council accused these reformers of honoring the seventh day, the Sabbath, more than the first day, Sunday. And that's what united their movement. The Council of Moscow was the beginning of the end for the Novgorod Moscow movement. It eventually died in the flames of Red Square. Elena Stefanovna and her son Dmitri fell out of favor. Their fate is unclear. Tsar Ivan III died, and Sophia's son Vasily took his place, just what his mother wanted. Early in the 16th century, the Muslim kingdom of Adal attacked the Christian empire of Ethiopia. This was a jihad, a Muslim holy war, backed by the powerful Ottoman Turks. It took over vast areas of the country, overwhelming the Ethiopian forces. 
In desperation, the emperor appealed to Portugal for aid. Several long and difficult years passed, and finally, in 1541, Portuguese troops arrived on the coast of what is now Eritrea. Cristoban da Gama, son of the famous navigator Vasco da Gama, commanded a band of 400 musketeers. Their mission, rescue Christian Ethiopia. It was a costly effort. In their first major battle, the Portuguese took heavy casualties. Da Gama himself was captured and beheaded by the Muslim commander. Fortunately, with the help of the surviving Portuguese force, Emperor Guladuos beat back the invaders in 1543, ending the Muslim threat. But a few years later, a new challenge to Ethiopia's Christianity appeared when Jesuit missionaries followed in the footsteps of the Portuguese troops. Facing privation, captivity, torture, and death, these Jesuits devoted themselves to bringing the Ethiopian church into the Roman Catholic fold. But there were major differences between the Ethiopian Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, not the least of which was that the Ethiopians observed the Seventh-day Sabbath, a practice that dated back at least a thousand years. Still, the Jesuit missionaries persisted. Finally, Emperor Susanius embraced the Roman Catholic Church and professed his allegiance to the Pope. In 1622, he proclaimed Roman Catholicism the official religion of his empire. Afonso Mendez, a Jesuit priest, arrived in Africa as the newly appointed patriarch of the Ethiopian church. With Mendez urging him on, Emperor Susanius issued a proclamation requiring his people to work on the Sabbath, a desecration of the holy day. That was a big mistake. A violent wave of protest swept over the land. The people rebelled. They refused to give up their traditional religion. Sassanius saw his good intentions trigger a bitter civil war. There were thousands of casualties. Amid the chaos and bloodshed came a voice of reason. Facilidas, one of his sons, talked to his father, Sassanius, and said, Look at how many people you have killed. They are our people. Some of them are your relatives. And uh, he convinced his father that what he did was wrong. Susinius passed another edict, finally, and said, when I accepted the Roman faith, I thought it was good for the people. But now, even the ignorant peasants choose to die to keep their tradition. From now on, he said, you are free to worship the way you want. In your churches, in your communities, you are free. Even today, the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath together with Sunday is common in Ethiopia, the nation with the world's longest history of Christian Sabbath keeping. You wake up one morning to the sound of policemen pounding on your door. They handcuff you and throw you into the back of a squad car and haul you off to jail without telling you why. They confiscate all your belongings and seize your life savings. You spend months in a lonely cell, wondering why you're there. Now and then the guards take you to be questioned by detectives, but it's a strange kind of interrogation. They want you to tell them why you've been arrested. They say there are seven or eight witnesses against you, but they won't say who they are. They want you to guess that too. Sometimes they torture you. You try to think of who it was that accused you of whatever crime you're supposed to have committed. And then you begin to name names, hoping to hit on the right ones. Sometimes they promise to let you go, but only if you cooperate. So eventually, you begin to make things up. 
to confess the things you've never done, hoping to satisfy them. After a year or so, they take you to a courtroom with several other prisoners. A judge is reading out the sentences. Some prisoners are getting off easy. Others are getting life in prison. Some are getting the death penalty. What will you get? Maybe that scenario gives you at least an inkling of what it was like to live in the grip of the infamous Inquisition, a diabolical scheme for identifying and eliminating religious dissent. The Inquisition in Europe in the Middle Ages had its own rationale, its own justification. The first justification was that this life is so much less important than the life to come and that therefore if a person's earthly life was taken away for the sake of his or her immortal soul, you were doing a favor to that person. However, it has to be said that the other rationale of the Inquisition was not so much to sentence people to death, through burning usually, but to reclaim the person, to persuade them to return to the bosom of Holy Mother the Church. Pope Gregory IX established the medieval Inquisition back in 1231 to protect the Catholic world from heretics and religious rebels. The Inquisition was a highly organized operation, combining the powers of both church and state. It was a devastating weapon. Simply put, it got results. In 1469, the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella merged the kingdoms of Aragon and Castile into the United Kingdom of Spain. By the way, this is the same Ferdinand and Isabella who sent Christopher Columbus on his voyage of discovery in 1492. The new king and queen were militantly Catholic, in fact, they are called the Catholic Monarchs. But they had to face the fact that their Spain was not as Catholic as they wanted it to be. You see, a generation or two earlier, the Jews of Spain had been compelled to convert to Catholicism under threat of deportation and loss of possessions. Now, these forced converts were called New Christians, and the title stuck. They were baptized Roman Catholics. But some of them, perhaps many of them, retain some traditional Jewish customs, like observing the seventh day, Saturday, as the Sabbath. Queen Isabella saw this as a serious desecration of the true Catholic religion. So in 1478, she persuaded the Pope to authorize the Spanish Inquisition. She wanted to purge her church of any taint of Jewish heresy. The power of the Inquisition was subtle and insidious. The Inquisitors urged people to spy on their friends, their neighbors, even members of their own families. They used threats and torture to coerce people to give evidence they needed. Hardcore heretics and repeat offenders faced the most extreme measures. They were turned over to the secular authorities for punishment. Some were burned in effigy. Others were burned at the stake, in person. I am Constantino. Oh God, can you hear me? Are there no cruel pagans? No bloodthirsty cannibals worse than ravaging beasts to whom you could deliver me? That I might escape these inhuman barbarians who keep me in this pit. Why am I here? Because of truth, because of the Sabbath, I have loved your word. I have taught it faithfully. Am I to die here, in this hall? Dr. Constantino Ponce de la Fuente was an immensely popular preacher and a gifted writer. He had traveled throughout much of Europe as chaplain to the imperial court. His peers held him in such high regard that he was elected magisterial canon of the great Cathedral of Seville, a huge Gothic structure that to this day ranks as the largest cathedral in the world. When Constantino preached, great crowds would pack the place to hear his sermons. But Dr. Constantino was a reformer. 
a particularly dangerous role to play in Seville, the very heart of the Spanish Inquisition. It was here that Constantino and a few of his colleagues adopted some rather un-Catholic views. While holding the highest office in the great cathedral, he, along with his friends, formed what he called the Secret Christian Church. Constantino believed that Christians should obey the Ten Commandments and that obedience is made possible through the gracious work of God in the Christian's life. In his opinion, obeying the Ten Commandments includes keeping the Sabbath on Saturday, the seventh day. Members of the newly formed Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, became suspicious of Constantino after hearing his sermons. The Office of the Inquisition repeatedly called him in to explain his teachings. His friends were concerned. He told them, they want me to be burned, but they found that I am still too green. Officers of the Inquisition finally arrested him in August of 1558 and took him to the Inquisitor's prison just outside Seville. Cut off from his friends and supporters and from the crowds that used to fill the cathedral, Constantino Ponce de la Fuente suffered his last days in a pitiless death trap. There was no crowd to hear his final words when he died in February 1560, another victim of the Spanish Inquisition. Like Spain, neighboring Portugal also needed a solution to the problem of the so-called new Christians. There the Inquisition began in 1536 and didn't finally end until well into the 19th century. It's 300 years of tyranny and oppression were marked by unspeakable cruelty and violence. Surviving records include long rosters of victims, meticulous accounts that document the human tragedies in short, cold summaries. One of this Inquisition's darkest chapters was written far from Portugal, way to the east in India. How, you might ask, did the Inquisition get there? Well, let me tell you. At the end of the 15th century, Vasco da Gama had sailed around the southern tip of Africa and on to India, opening up the sea route from the Atlantic coast of Europe all the way to the Orient. The Portuguese government quickly laid claim to key portions of India. It was a new world of opportunity. Eventually, many new Christians immigrated there, hoping to find a new life beyond the reach of the Inquisitors. But in 1560, the Portuguese Inquisition came to India, headquartered in Goa. It specifically targeted Christians who refused to work on Saturday and who began observing the Sabbath on Friday evening as taught in the Bible. Indeed, most of those being accused were of Jewish origin. The exceptions involved some people in the East who had no Jewish roots, but who observed, for instance, the Sabbath. It may be that those Sabbath keepers who had no roots in Judaism are evidence of the local Indian Christians who had observed the Sabbath for hundreds of years, whose Sabbath customs dated back to the very first Christian churches in India. These local people weren't even Catholic, nor could they be called new Christians. But this didn't protect them from the long reach of the Inquisition of Goa. I am Charles Delon, a physician and a citizen of France. Why am I here, a prisoner of the Inquisition? The accusations against me are the creations of my enemies. I am no heretic, yet I have despaired of ever leaving this place. They want me to confess, but confess what? I have confessed again and again. At least I'm not one of the new Christians. That's who they are really after. 
We know about Charles DeLone's case because he later wrote about it in detail. Accused of only trivial offenses, he was held for two long years before his trial. His judges banished him forever from India and sentenced him to five years as a slave laborer in the shipyards of Lisbon. He was more fortunate than most. Friends from France intervened on his behalf, and he won an early release from the Inquisitor General. In 1677, he returned safely to France, where he began to write about his nightmare as a victim of the Inquisition. In his account, he claims that a majority of those burned at the stake for Judaizing were not Jews at all, but Christians who kept the Sabbath. When he nailed his 95 theses to the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Martin Luther really didn't mean to turn the Christian world upside down. But Luther had started a fire that no one could put out. 